So my name's David. I'm the Dynamic Dreamscapes Officer. How many times did I say this? For Wales. We have a very exciting project that we'll be running over the next three years across South Wales and some sites on Anglesey as well. I'm joined today by Nick Edwards from NRW, who will be giving us a talk around Oxwich, a place he's worked at and looked after for some time. Um, so lots of exciting information about Oxwich and we'll just run through the project where we're working and the opportunities that are available. How we hope to support you as a community and as an individual. So the Dynamic Dunescapes project will restore sand dunes across England and Wales for the benefit of wildlife, people and communities. The Dynamic Dunescapes project is big and ambitious. We are targeting some of the most important sand dune systems across these two countries. Sand dunes have been identified as one of Europe's most threatened habitats. They are a sanctuary to many rare and unique species, as well as to people, as great places to find quiet and calm, or on a blustery day like we've seen in the last couple of weeks, a place to see some nature in action and really feel the wildness that these places give us. For dunes to be healthy, sand needs to be free to move within the dune system and be dynamic. And what we've found and what the research and the science has led us to the development of this project is that many of our dunes are stagnating. They have become slow and unmoving creatures, if we could call them that. So our work will look to our conservation work will practically address those issues. And my work as an engagement officer should see us working with our communities to bring our dunes and our coasts to life in a variety of different ways. So how will we work with communities? We want to work with local people, people that use these spaces on a regular basis, as well as those that come to visit. We want to prove, improve access and understanding of these fantastic spaces. Now I'm just gonna briefly go through these points here and we will come back to them in greater detail. So we have opportunities for young people for our young person's bursary. We'll be looking to uh, roll out over the autumn and into next year. We have opportunities to support local artists and local communities through our arts funding. We really feel at the centre of our project is important to improve inclusion and access for groups that may not be able to access the dunes or may not realise and our coasts or may not realise how they can do that. So bringing, uh, bringing our dunes to those who are shielding or can't get to the coast through soundscapes, film and stories. We know how important a connection with nature is for supporting people's health as well as the opportunity to be outside and moving in a moving space. So we want to help support people's health outcomes as well as work closely with carers and the networks that surround them to give carers and those they care for opportunities to explore our coastal spaces. As the project develops we'll be looking to work with schools to build school partnerships. So where are we working? Dynamic dunescapes will see 7,000 hectares of dune systems across England and Wales with practical conservation work undertaken. That's 34 sites in the UK and 10 sites in Wales. Seven of these sites sit in South Wales and the remainder we'll find in Anglesey. So we, have an, we are rich with sand dune sites and work that can be undertaken on them. And today we'll be talking, focusing our work on the Gower and Oxwich. Our previous webinar, we focused and looked at the changes to Bagland Burrows, the fantastic dune system 
perched on the edge of the industrial um, coastline of Neath Patalba. So why are they so important? Sand dune systems are some of the UK's wildest places. They are pathless, expansive, a place to get lost in and then find yourself all over, and they are thriving with life. They've long been places of refuge for people and wildlife. And they will often frequently overcome those communities that stay for too long exemplified by the buried villages, churches and castles that we find up and down our coastline. They are steeped in history from World War II training to those two shipwreckers who drew ships onto the coast around Neath and Carmarthenshire. They are incredibly diverse. They're unique shifting landscapes creating multiple vibrant habitats that support a fantastic array of wildlife. From otters in the dune slacks, these filled corridors in the winter, um, bitterns, runs of orchids between May and June that will blow your mind. They are also sanctuaries for ground nesting birds and in some rare spaces, the mighty sand lizard. The Gower, as you may or may not know, is has one of the most exciting coastlines of South Wales. We'll be working along at four sites, Pennard and Penmine, which overlook Three Cliffs Bay. These ancient perched dunes have gone through their life cycle and are now, um, and have created a space or a habitat we call Dune Heath. Now 20% of all of Wales' dune heath can be found at these two sites. And we are looking at ways to restore them in a way that can, they will look after themselves, working with local partners um, to do this. We'll be looking at working over in Bruffton, as you can see, perhaps you can see the shift in the amount of bare sand, and this is a really key ingredient to a healthy dune system, from 1969 to this 2017 photo. And finally, we'll be working in Oxwich, to which Nick will give us some information now. So we'll just switch over. Nick, are you ready? I'm ready, David. Thank you for that. Fantastic. So over to you, Nick. Excellent stuff. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, I suppose it's a sign of the times that we're doing these kind of webinars and something I haven't done before, but hopefully you can hear me okay. I'll spare you the video of my grizzled face, but you can certainly hear me okay. Um, and if you do hear me slurping, it's just my cup of tea. Yeah, David's going to do the transition of the slides. Um, for me. Um, to start, a little bit about myself, I've been working for NRW and CCW for over 20 years, um, managing the nature reserves primarily on Gower, um, but also uh, stints in Brecon Beacons and, and wood, woodland sites um, uh, around the place. So, I shan't, I see you, I'll not see you, but um, so I'm going to give you an overview of, of Oxwich, uh, the kind of stuff we've been doing, the kind of stuff that's gone on in the past, a bit of history of the place, um, an exciting HLF project that we've got running amongst other things. So if we can start, David, we'll, we'll get a shift on. Go the next slide. Brilliant. So we got two nice pictures. I'm lucky to have lots of nice pictures from uh, predecessors and, and, and volunteers. Um, I won't claim um, that I've taken all these. Uh, some of our horses won, won the winters and then a nice autumn picture there. So yeah, David, that's fine. Stick the next one on. So Oxwich 
is managed by Natural Resources Wales. It's also owned uh, by Natural Resources Wales. It's one of the few sites that we actually do own. A lot of them we lease and manage um, on behalf of other people, NGOs, other local authorities, etc. Um, but we actually own Oxwich. It's one of the most diverse coastal NNRs in the UK. It's a special place. Um, it's part of the Oxwich Bay SSSI, but it has a plethora of SSSIs within it, um, both habitats and species. Um, it was designated for its flowers in the beginning, in the 1960s. Um, we've had over 600 flowering species recorded across the site. Um, the site ranges from intertidal through the beach, through the dune system, um, salt marsh, um, freshwater marsh, um, alluvial woodland, open water, reed bed, ditches, cliff, I'm sure there's some I've forgotten. Um, really important uh, floristically, really important for its inver inverts, and over the last 10 years, gaining real importance with its wildfowl and waders. Um, it's a very, very busy place. Um, it's, a, it's a jewel in the crown of Gower. Um, Gower being the first AOMB um, in Britain, which I'll go on to later. Uh, we can get up to half a million visitors a year. Uh, Gower itself gets over three million. Um, most people come to Gower for it's, it's, it's amazing landscape and beaches. and So we can get lots of visitors, which, which uh, gives a lot of pressure then to the beach uh, and then and now. It's also synonymous with students. Uh, since the 60s and the, the, the birth of the um, Gower Field Education Project, uh, we get about 10,000 students a year. A lot of them repeat students, a lot of them students come from schools have been sending students for the last 20, 30 years. Um, so they utilise the site well. Have the next one, Dave, please. So a bit more on the history. Um, it's got a really interesting history, Oxwich. Um, it's a sort of man-made reserve, if you like. Um, but the, the actual NNR history itself, I'll go into the history of the wider area after this, but as I said before, it was designated Triple SI in the 1960s. Um, 500 flowering plants recorded in the dunes, 600 of the site all in all. Um, it was purchased by the Nature Conservancy Council in the 1980s. We leased it from the 1960s. Uh, there was an obvious need to protect it as the sand dunes went from 90% bare sand into succession. Then we had all the pioneering plants and inverts coming in. Um, therefore, it was given the designation it deserved. Uh, it was managed by the Nature Conservancy Council through to the birth of the Countryside Council for Wales in 91 and then Natural Resources Wales from now. Um, one of the big things, and David's picked upon it, is the way we managed it um, and where we are today. And one of the big things that I suppose we did wrong was when we had all the pioneering species and the bare sand and, and, and the statuses, we sort of panicked a bit and we went out and planted a load of marram grass and built boardwalks and put up fences and stopped people walking through. So the bare sands disappeared into what we have now across the UK into a big stabilised um, vegetation zone, I suppose. Uh, next one, David, please. Okay, the next one, David. There you go, man. So the history of Oxford, really important um, history, uh, really interesting history. Um, the, the sand dunes are formed in a storm in the Middle Ages. It's, 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 um, as it's been recorded, but the, the port itself of Oxwich was a really busy medieval port, um, transporting stuff pretty much to the rest of the part of Britain and Europe, mainly to Devon and Ireland, uh, agriculture, limestone that was quarried from Oxwich and the rest of Gower, um, crops and livestock, uh, amongst other things. It was... Um, the big change after the kind of Middle Ages came with Mansell Tall, but the owner of the Penrice Estate, who was also the owner of Margam and hence Port Talbot um, in the 18th century, around about 1740s. And the Penrice House, uh, looking over the 
reserve in Oxwich. Um, went through some changes uh, to the landscape and some and some redesigns as it was, you know, popular in the time. And they uh, in, they put a seawall in um, alongside the uh, salt marsh, um, which stopped the influx of saline water coming through um, up the pill. Um, and, and made the salt water, salt marsh a fresh water marsh. And they dug out a lake system to replicate the serpentine lakes in Hyde Park um, for recreation use. Um, you know, thousands of manpower, lots of money, um, and that kind of changed the landscape a bit. Um, the next big thing from that was the training in World War II. Americans were based in, um, in Gower and uh, they did a lot of D-Day training on the dunes. The dunes were mainly used for grazing. There wasn't a huge amount of sand, uh, sorry, there wasn't a huge amount of vegetation on the sand, but the army came in with tanks and vehicles and basically stripped the dunes and they dug up the dunes and they moved the dunes um, in all their training and then left. And then that resulted from the 19, late 1940s through the 50s of sand blowing across the road and into the village. Um, and that's why we had a bit of stabilization and a bit of um, work as I've, as, I've, as I've said. Next one, if you can do it. Education, as I said, synonymous with Oxwich. Um, the old center there uh, sadly went in 1995 and had a huge impact on what we could deliver on site. Um, but we had the, the education, um, Gower Field Education Project running hand in hand with the with the triple um, SI and then later on to the NNR uh, designation uh, for all the schools in the area. Um, I've got people coming down, um, teachers who remember it and have brought kids down that they now teach. Uh, sadly, we don't have the centre there. Um, I'll go on to, on, on to that a bit later on because we have got some exciting news there mainly to do with the dunes and geography, but key stage across the, across the range, uh, little ones to adults, to further learning, to PhDs and, and masters. Um, so we're, we're still, to this day, uh, educating people and, and using the resource for education, um, which, is the, which is fantastic. Okay, dude. So then now a bit. So I've mentioned three million people a year a lot of people. Um, it's a very popular tourist attraction as a pleasure beach. Um, it's got a car park run by the estate, it's got shops, it's got toilets, it's um, easy to get to off the M4 corridor. Um, Gower has um, a history of holiday makers coming in from different parts of the UK, uh, whether it's the, the valleys of, of, of Wales or Birmingham or Manchester or London. Oxford is very popular with people from Swansea. Um, it's still very popular now. Um, you can see the bottom picture there taken in the 80s uh, when people were allowed to drive on the beach and, and bring their boats and, you know, and we, had, we had thousands of people. And then that's a picture taken a few years ago. Um, hence um, the kind of uh, showing the numbers recently but we've had massive amounts of people in the last couple of weeks probably akin to the 1980s um, because of the, the situation with COVID. Um, there's a lot of pressure with people as you can all understand um, health and safety issues and there's illegal things that go on there's litter there's fires there's parties there's all this kind of thing so it has a direct impact on some of the features especially in the slacks um, especially in the frontal dunes um, whether there's erosion or there's, you know, um, destruction through fires or but it's one of those things and something we deal with. Okay, David. So I'm not allowed to say problems. I'm, I think it's challenges and maybe issues, I'm unsure. But this is the kind of thing we get. Um, and sadly, these days we get tents left and they've got all the stuff in them and they make a bit of a mess. But the impact it has is mainly fires and people put in tents on top of rare smaller flowers and smaller plants that they don't know about. Um, so we've got to deal with that. There's some fires there, which obviously kill the, um, the, the, 
the habitat entirely and then goes deep down to the root system so it affects things for for many years and the one on the right's an interesting one um that's a bit of steel from a shipwreck that no one knew about that has uncovered itself um a few years ago and was was basically a really sharp steel triangle um sticking out where the the main surfing uh, area is at high tide so anyone coming off the board would have uh, been in trouble but um so we managed to get rid of that but you know they're just issues next one please so there you go that's the kind of stuff we get um the stuff on the left is what's left the stuff on the right is normally what's dumped in the sea or the rivers and uh, comes up to us um we have we've taken over five ton of litter um before now um it's gone down over the last couple of years but obviously it's still uh, it's still there so yeah the next one uh, which came up with kind of the early species we had um and we're trying to get back uh, if we can with the kind of work we do with the hlf and the nnr management uh, on the left is petal work and on the right is um fen orchid um it's not a great picture but the two were there in oxwich in the 60s and early 70s um in good numbers um they slowly sort of declined through the 80s and disappeared in the 90s um because of the lack of succession uh, but these are the kind of things that we want to be getting back if we can by the correct kind of management and there's a kind of management from the past that's what we were doing we were taking the sand dunes that we had and we were planting masses of, of marram in it with volunteers with workers with um different projects and yts schemes and then basically fencing it off to watch it grow that's the one on the right there is 20 years after um where we're trying to get get a grasp on the regrowth by continuously cutting it so we brought in some goats um, from north wales to help us with some electric fencing uh, one of the many things that we've used we don't have the goats anymore um, they were quite difficult to manage good so that's the kind of thing we do as well you sort of replicate what animals can do with modern technology um, we, we bruise the dunes with a, with a bracken bruiser to keep the bracken down um, so the flowers get a chance um, we use sort of equipment which is bespoke um, to cut the wetter areas to chip scrub and mow and then we also have the the um the stock which we are grateful for the ponies there we go section a mountain ponies we've had an ox switch for 20 20 years now we, we change numbers and then things like the highland cattle in the wet wet areas of the fen to keep the uh the more woody stuff down it's all part of the management so the other thing is volunteers David touched upon it in the beginning. Uh, volunteers are massively important to us. Uh, the ones on the left work for us, for NRW. The ones on the right were from HSBC. Um, we lost a bit of the volunteer um, input of late, but we're glad to say that it's now come back this year, and we're hoping to take that forward. The volunteers, it's, it's great. I mean, they get um, appreciation of the countryside, of what we do, the importance of nature conservation. Um, and they also get a good day out with some beers and some barbecue. So the kind of species Oxwich is renowned for um, is very wide and, and broad. Um, of all the flowers that we've got and the inverts and butterflies, I tried to encapsulate a few of them here, basically by the best photos I had. The wildfowl and, and waders and the associated birds with the open water started coming back in mid 2000s 2005 um gadwall we had a uh, one uh, percent of the british um population things like breeding kingfisher came back uh, we've currently got three different pairs in and around um in around the system and obviously flowers then the bee orchid a kind of be uh, iconic kind of picture that we associate with the dunes in oxwich and then on the right, the tiny Hachinsia, which is one of our first flowering species we have in in May, um, sometimes earlier April. 
Um, it's really, really small, but it's it's a really good indicator of where we've got bare sand and um, the kind of vegetation mix. So that's some of them. And then some rarer stuff, tway blade and sea stock. Um, sea stock's one of our uh, rarer ones that we, we, we get in kind of small clumps. Um, we've only got two plants at the moment. Uh, we might have more, we may have less. Some years we don't have any, um, but it's all part of the monitoring. And it's all really associated with the kind of management we do and the structure of the dune system. Um, if we don't have kind of um, succession we do, we don't get the plants. So butterfly is also um, quite synonymous with, with Oxwich. We've got over 20 species. Butterfly transects now in its 28th year. Um, it's one of the oldest transects we've got in the UK. Um, we're, we're, we've got a good number of small blue. We've got uh, marbled white on the right there on the, on the up. Um, very good years in between. We get lots of migratory butterflies coming in like painted ladies. Um, clouded yellow, and then we get the 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 the, the others in. Then that's um, synonymous with Oxford's the blues and the and the um, skippers and the meadow browns and and um, and, and the like. Um, very good for adders and and grass snakes. Uh, we do a lot of reptile monitoring with the with ARC, the Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust. Uh, Oxwich has got um, a very good adder uh, high vernacular and um, good populations there. We, uh, we're one of the few places in Britain where we've recorded adder every every month of the year. Uh, so we do a lot of monitoring there with, with people like them. And then we were lucky enough to have BTO helping us with bird ringing um, over the last few years. Um, we've done a lot of work within the dune system and the lakes and the freshwater marsh and and um, having people like the BTO coming in doing bird ringing every 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 week gives us a um, gives us a, a um, an insight into what birds we have throughout the year um, and then what populations are increasing or decreasing or habits or migratory habits and um, we can then um, collect that evidence for ourselves and others. Um, but that's also a good one. So we're going to the dynamic dunescapes and the kind of project we're running with the HLF. Uh, we started the work in the winter, uh, just gone. Uh, we had some really good contractors in, some really good equipment doing some large scale work within the dunes. Um, part of the work we do is, is stopping evolution. We're stopping the dune system turning into an oak woodland. Um, our slacks, our, our wet areas, the areas behind the, the dunes where we've got the, the best um, flowers and, then the, and, the, and the, the better species um, do become inundated with woody weeds and scrub and we have to cut them um, not on an annual basis sometimes but if we leave it more than a couple of years it turns into a bit of a woodland. So we've had these guys in this year doing a bit of mowing doing a bit of cutting, a lot of treating the stumps with, with chemicals to stop the regrowth. Um, so they did some really good good work on the slacks um, in the other frontal dunes there. Okay. So this is what we've done so far. Uh, we took these slacks in the frontal dunes, which is very close to the beach there. Um, they were basically, one was a scrape, one was a woodland, one was a transitioned area from a, from a slack to a woodland. Um, we went in with these machines, with these guys, we did it large scale, we, we cut down the trees, we treated the stumps, um, we took away the wood, we chipped the wood, we removed the chip and started using the chip for these things like the volunteers. Uh, we set up a hydro hydrological survey um, with a contractor who's put in a number of dip wells in across the site to give us some kind of idea as to, um, as to what the water's doing, what the aquifer's doing, the kind of, if we're retaining water, and that gives us a good um, insight then if we're gonna do any kind of dune rejuvenation, any scrapes, how, how far we need to dig down, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, the mechanical notches are gonna create, are gonna create notches this winter. 
Um, we've worked with the likes of Ken Pye and others to sort of work out how big a notch we need and where it needs to go um, to encapsulate the wind coming in and the sand blowing through and hopefully to create a bit more um, succession and some new, and some new slacks. Um, and then the rabbits. The rabbits is a, a big thing that I think that we all forgot about for a number of years and how important they were and how important they are to the, to the, to the, to the dune system. Um, Oxwich is full of myxomatosis, unfortunately. Um, whenever we do get a small population, they disappear. Um, and we're hoping to generate a bigger population and, and try to maintain a population from one area to the next by keeping the sward down, by mixing it with grazing. Um, but that's going to be a real challenging bit of work. And then just keeping on top of the scrub and the invasive species that we have, which is a uh, you know, which is bread and butter for us. So here's some pictures you can see on the left hand side what it was like uh, just after the war when the army had been in and, and taken all the vegetation away and we had, you know, 90% bare sand. And the middle picture is probably when it was at its peak um, to do with nature conservation and species, um, when it was at its best, if you like. And then there we are on the right. Um, where we've got very little embryonic dunes, no notches, only one or two big dune, big dune systems, a lot of scrub, um, woodlands appearing. You know, it, it's a it's a it's a big it's a it's a big amount of work. And of course, there's a difference between conservation and preservation. We're conserving what we've got in our lifetime, and we're not trying to preserve it to a time um, like the first picture or the second picture, because that would be very difficult to do. Um, but we are certainly with projects like the HLF starting to turn the tide and get back to some kind of equilibrium. Okay. So there you go, there's the guys with the machines. Um, sometimes you do it um, a bit more uh, hands-on, a bit sometimes you've got to bring in the big kit, and this time we did, and it was really, really rewarding. Um, they managed to get in, get out quickly, um, whilst it was dry enough to do so. Now you can see there the um, the 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 woodland on the on the on the, on the left hand side that that's gone. Uh, most of it's in the back of the chip there. The chip there then goes into paths um, with the volunteers that we have in around the reserve and elsewhere. So it's reused, uh, which is great. And then there's our contractor with his dog putting in some dip wells for us. Um, we haven't had a a good idea on the water levels for many years and this has been a, a real um, plus for us so they're going to go across the dunes as I said and give us some kind of idea um, to what the water's doing and when um, so we can manage to um, do our stuff at the same time and that's what we want really that's that's a scrape that was put in one of those pictures of the dunes many years back and that's a notch in another one of my sites that we did with a big machine and that's the kind of stuff we want to be doing this winter to try and uh, break through the vegetation and get some sand moving. So a new start for us, uh, as I said earlier on in the, in the beginning, that's our new interpretation slash education building, which we've had put in in, in Oxwich, uh, which we lost in 1995. We've tried many times to get one back there but we failed, but um, we, managed to manage, we managed to get it in this year. Uh, we've got a long way to go. We've got to bring in people to help us with interpretation, but that's going to be hopefully a meeting point for us to engage with students as they're coming in. And then the Oxford Volunteer Project, uh, bringing people in locally, um, bringing people in from industry um, and getting them into the dunes doing stuff is the idea. And then the HLF project, as we're talking about, and then alongside that, the education provision project that we've lost out on the last couple of years. But hopefully we're going to kick start again with all this new and exciting work. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Just a gratuitous nice picture to finish, uh, which I took a couple of months ago early, and uh, hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you very much.
was a strange noise. Thank you very much, Nick. But very uh, useful for hopefully for all of us to see and hear. If you have any questions that have come out from what Nick's saying, please uh, throw them into the chat box on the side. Um, and we try and answer them while we've got Nick here as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to talk to you now about how dynamic Dreamscapes hopes to work and can support you within your community. So there's some things that we can do now. So we can join the conversation. Um, let us know how we can help you. We, there are fantastic stories in and amongst all of us in our communities and we hope to capture that for our Coastal Stories project that we're looking to start over the autumn. But you could start it now for us. Record and collect your stories from across Gower. Speak to your friends and your relatives. Maybe it's a memorable sunset, shipwreck or a rescue, but have a cup of tea and press record on your phone and send that over and we can get the ball rolling. Share your June photos, people, wildlife, at June's Wales. Um, as Nick has just touched on, there is quite a useful volunteer opportunity for conservation work at Oxwich. Uh, Nick's contact details are at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you want to you know, get out there, help support this work, um, then do get in touch with Nick and the NRW team at Oxwich. But secondly, we'll be looking beyond um, that's a typical conservation work to run and undertake events and support other people's events and to help bring people closer to nature. And you can sign up um, on the Dynamic Dunescapes website and that just gives us a really good understanding of who you are, what you might be interested in doing from beach art to beach cleans to identification moonlight walks the world is our oyster uh, and then finally so oxwich is unique for the dunescapes project and that it work doing some of the regeneration of the dune slats so those wet areas that nick described actually began um, over christmas so as part of our project we want to monitor and consider the changes we're making and how they are supporting improvements to wildlife. Um, so join our citizen science team. We'll be running identification and general habitat training. You don't have to have any prior knowledge um, throughout the autumn. We have developed an app which will then allow you as a resident or visitor to Oxwich to go out and begin to collect data. So if you do see um, one of these rare species or an invasive species, you'll then be able to, from your phone, picture, GPS tag and identify to help our conservation efforts. So you can be a volunteer as and when you have the time, um, but we will, we hope to and want to support you through a set of training that will help you with that work from identifying invasive species that we'd be looking to remove in the autumn, to with the new spring flush in the new year, identifying those rare and unique species as with each month. So we'll be setting challenges and targets for you to go out and find some of these fantastic species. Um, we have alongside this, uh, so we have a young person's bursary that I touched on earlier. This is for individuals between 16 and 30. It's an, so as an outline of the fund, um, as a broad example, we would like those applying for it to support that the work that you hope to do to support engagement with our coastline and our dune systems at one of or at another site on Gower. This could be anything from film to create soundscapes or coastal or recording a coastal stories project. Um, it might be that you want to put on an event or have workshops or training that will help you understand and be part of the conservation effort. It might be that you want to support others getting to the coast. We really want to improve the opportunities for those that wouldn't traditionally um, engage with conservation work or just tradition or just have the ability to go visit the coast. 
So we are open for our young people to, to express their ideas and thoughts and we'll work with you to help facilitate your undertaking um, to accessing this fund. It could be if you're in education to support research on the dunes or if you're out of education, it might be training that can support your future work. And the funding can cover training, equipment, transport costs, and you'll have my support if you're delivering um, events or workshops or you need some support with your, with your ideas to start up with. We also have an arts fund and we want to support creativity in our communities. Um, but also, you know, art is a quite a slim term, but actually we, this can cover and come at wherever you are coming from. So it could be film, photography, paint, woodwork, storytelling. And uh, these are all really powerful ways to share and create uh, connections with places and an understanding of um, the importance of these spaces. It might be that as a community group, you've got some ideas about something that you would like help with. So you might want someone to come in and run workshops for you, um, in which case please get in touch because then we can arrange that that art funding to be used to support you, whether this is your interest in the Coastal Stories project or pulling together a historical or artistic installation, outdoor film showing, um, so yeah, anything from events workshops or training. The funding can cover paying for workshops and materials, event support, travel for participants. As an artist or a creative, we invite you to, to get in touch um, and we'll talk about your ideas and how we can uh, go through that process so we can support you in one way, whether it's physically with this funding and because it fits well with um, our outcomes, or if we can support you in other ways as well. Uh, here's some beat chart we created last week at Caswell, and there's a number, there's huge interest in the history of our spaces and places, and I am open to you know that being part of that story that builds um, our artistic installation. Um, we have a great desire to work with you and for you. So working with existing service provision um, to use our funding and my time and our resources to help people access our sites, engage with nature who wouldn't normally uh, consider this as a conservation project, something that would have any relevance to them. We've begun work with Surfers Against Sewage, um, so we're hopefully being able to support and encourage the beach cleans that are already happening. We're working with Department for Work and Pensions, so they're providing training that young people need and want to help them into employment, from bush cutter to uh, those tickets that will allow them to practically go out into the world um, and undertake work outside but can support our conservation effort in the times and spaces where we need people to be cutting and undertaking that style of work. We want to work closely with the health services, supporting mental and physical health and wellbeing outcomes for, for people in our communities, but uh, maybe more specifically, you know, where our carers out there, there are people that may have been shielding now for months and we want to support you um, so if you are a carer or you do support someone, um, we'd really, you know, we'd like your, what, what is it, how can we support you? Um, if it's drop me a quick email or a phone call, we can arrange a time that's good for you just to have a quick chat. We are currently developing maps that should help, um, we should highlight how to access spaces, short walks, whether you're a family with little ones, so that you, and an understanding of what's open and how you can get. We are looking to work with schools. We have a variety of resources and borrow boxes. Um, so please, again, if your, uh, your work aligns, uh, we'd love to, yeah, please get in touch and see how we can support you, perhaps with some workshops or some exploratory days. For those volunteer and community groups out there, for those artists already out there running events, um, we have 25 deck chairs and 25 windbreaks and two pop-up gazebos. So this resource that we have, we'd like to bring to the community to help support your work. Um, you know, so if there's resources you need, um, 
what we ask is, you know, we can, I can run some training so that we have June ambassadors so that you understand the project and are able to talk to people about it. Um, and then, you know, this resource is here. I'd rather it was out with you supporting your work or maybe your business. If you need additional outside space at your beachside cafe, your June side cafe, they are here and we are open to you. So I hope this has been an interesting and useful introduction to the project, the ways, many different ways that we are working. Our, I'm just gonna quickly jump back to our Citizen Science app, which should be available by the end or beginning of October. And because we have work already undertaken at Opswitch, we want to begin monitoring those changes. So if you're just interested in going out and having an opportunity to find out what's what, and we will be putting on the training and events, so please keep an eye out. Uh, my name is David. I'm the Engagement Officer for Wales. Um, so please do get in contact with me either via email, through our website and the volunteer form, or see our work on Facebook and Twitter. If you are local to Oxwich or the surrounding area and you're interested in joining up with the NRW's volunteer team, please contact Nick at NRW um, and they'll be able to explain how you can join that process and you know get outside during these times, maybe not today, but certainly yesterday was such a gorgeous day and there are many more to come. The project's running for the next three years. Um, so please, you know, we will be around, we'll be running events and hopefully there'll be things that we can help support you with and engage, um, give you opportunities um, to work in our community. So thank you all for listening. Um, I'll just see if there's any questions. Um, there's a question from Alice around the Talbot State Buildings at Oxwich, um, so within the Penrith State. I do believe there are some that are open. I don't know if we can, we can gain, anyone has any more insight into that. But Alice, we can pick that up because I think I've got your contact details. Guys, thank you all very much for your time. I hope this has been really useful for you. Uh, many thanks and uh, I hope to hear from you soon.